Welcome to Global Science, everyone. We have invited three luminaries from the financial industry. Good to be back, Bruce. Thank you. Nice to be with you, Bruce. Good morning, Bruce, from France. I want to thank all three for joining us today. Now, I want to ask the first question to all participants. Manny, to start with you, along with the rest of the world, Korea is also expected to raise interest rates during the second half of this year. Will Korea still be an attractive investment destination? I believe we'll see a bit of reversal in financial markets globally, not just in Korea. In the US, for example, the CPI jumped to its highest since 2008, and governments of developed countries are beginning to be alarmed by the rising inflation. So Korea saw asset prices, commodity prices surge in the past year. Now, how the government tackled this, um, be it you know how rapidly and by how much they raised interest rates, pose a pretty great risk to um, um, financial markets. And markets in general do not like uncertainty, and we're trading at pretty on the high end of um, historical valuations already. Now, having said that, um, you know export figures. Um, consumer sentiments, retail sales are all pretty strong in Korea. So while I would prefer to be on the conservative side when it comes to equity investment, Korea is still relatively attractive. Now, Simon, same question to you. I agree with Manny. I think that rates are going to be ticking up uh, towards the end of this year globally, and that will impact uh, Korea as well. Uh, but you do also have this uh, Robin Hood phenomenon in, in Korea, where you've got a lot of young people, young aspiring professionals who are pouring money into the markets, looking for higher returns, looking for that uh, nest egg that is going to help them get on the housing ladder. And I think uh, we might be surprised uh, by Korea. I think also you have um, a lot of must-have stocks for institutional investors, chip manufacturers, which are not available in other markets and will continue to be sought out. There's also the uh, decarbonization story. There are a lot of players amongst uh, big cap companies in, in Korea, uh, which uh, again uh, in Asia are important constituents of the low carbon economy. And this is a, an area of the global equity universe that people are waking up to. So Korea is an interesting one. Um, rates certainly will start to nudge up, but the market, I feel, in international standards uh, is still uh, very cheap and attractive. Now, James, finally to you. In Korea, as Simon said, you know, there's so many interesting stocks, uh, many of them that institutions should be holding, others that represent the economy of the future. And that economy of the future, which Simon referred to by the shorthand of the green economy, for example, electric automobiles. So Hyundai and Kia are very interesting on a long-term basis. It's not what they're worth today, it's what they'll be worth a decade from now. And alongside the electric vehicles, we need electric batteries. And who is making those in the top leagues of the world? Well, I think LG is one of the shining stars out there, following hard on the heels of the famous names of China and, and Japan. And I have a lot of confidence that LG will actually uh, be one of the leaders over the next five and 10 years, because that battery arena, battery manufacturing, is a key competence for this green economy of the future. Now, Menyi, how will an interest rate hike affect both the bond and foreign exchange markets? After a rate hike, how will fund flows between developed and emerging markets change? More importantly, how can investors take advantage of these changes? Well, a popular trade earlier this year was shorting the US Treasuries. Some investors saw the rise of interest rates to be imminent and you know, the dollar would strengthen, investment grade bond prices would come down. However, with the 10 year Treasury yield back to its lowest in four months, the market hasn't really played out that way. Um, currently, we're seeing a huge discrepancy in the normalization of economic 
activity between the developed and developing countries. So the U.S. in particular is seeing strong economic recovery, um, high vaccination rates, a lot of fiscal stimulus, good employment numbers. On that basis, coupled with an interest rate hike, that will certainly drain funds away from emerging markets, and we might see a sell-off in emerging markets assets. In this case, an interesting sector um, investors can look at will be the financial institutions in the U.S. The banks, for example, have been suffering from very low interest rate margins. Um, so if the normalization of monetary policy does bring about the widening of interest rate um, margins and there is a real recovery in the real economy uh, and that brings about an improvement in the loan book, then financial institutions might see improved earnings in the near future. Simon, debates over the U.S. stock market valuations are getting heated. Do you think that the U.S. stock market is in a bubble? Should there be tapering? If you think that tapering is needed, when would be the right time? Well, as we said at the outset uh, of this conversation, I think there will be rate hikes towards the end of the year. But I, I don't really see any acceleration of that process while we're in the middle of this continued pandemic. We're coming out of that, thank goodness, uh, but growth is really still precarious. Markets have been extremely strong, um, particularly, of course, in the U.S. And we don't expect to see Korea decoupling from the U.S. in particular. But overall, emerging markets have been through a 10-year period post-global financial crisis of huge underperformance. You've got this peculiar situation where economies in the uh, Asian region have been relatively strong, but financial markets uh, overall, relative to the United States, have been very weak and in valuation terms are at their low point uh, over the 20-year, uh, perhaps, uh, um, I think, post-1960s uh, in terms of valuation. So, um, in answer to your question, should there be tapering? Um, I, I think there will be, inevitably, but it's not coming just yet. James, other than a possible interest rate hike, are there any important factors that we should pay attention to for the Korean stock market? Oh, I think there's always a lot of important uh, things to pay attention to. Obviously, if there are disruptions uh, in the markets of the U.S. and Europe, and, you know, let's be frank, they are facing a lot of challenges there. They have been printing money like there's no tomorrow. The balance sheets of both the Fed and the European central banks are so bloated and, and enormous at this point. When we talk about tapering, it sounds so gentle and nice. But, you know, does tapering simply mean that we stop printing more money? Or does it mean that we actually start reducing those balance sheets? In my opinion, the latter is going to be extraordinarily difficult to do. So I'm assuming that when people talk about tapering at the central bank level, they're really just referring to a slowing down of that printing process as opposed to a reversal of it where they pull money back out of the markets. If they pull money back out of the markets, we should expect to see a a quite strong slump in those markets. But that has not been how they've managed the markets for the last decade, so I'm not expecting that. I'm hoping also we don't have trade issues with China and the US and Europe in some, some fashion trying to sort of play the strong guys in the face of China's booming economy. Uh, I'm hoping that the positives will be things that are uh, uh, in those econ economic sectors that are so dynamic at the moment, semiconductors, electric vehicles, batteries, the green economy, the new economy of the future as opposed to the old economy of the past. Now the last question, again, is to all three. Now Simon, looking at the second half of this year, are there any sectors or stocks that you find attractive in both the Korean and U.S. stock markets? We believe that uh, people are waking up to the fact that uh, the Korean stock market does represent a huge repository 
of interesting companies are very much the ones uh, that James has outlined. We love the electric vehicle battery makers. Uh, we, we love the electric vehicle companies, the Hyundai Motors, the Kias. Um, we also uh, have a company called CS Wind Corporation, which is, I think, our largest uh, position in our portfolio. And when it comes to semiconductors, um, perhaps some of the bigger large cap companies would be vulnerable to a setback. But there are some of the smaller companies, specialist companies, which are in this uh, area of industry, which I think are going to continue to be sought after, specialist companies. Uh, we like a company called Tokai Carbon Korea. Uh, that's an important constituent in our portfolio. And one company I came across quite recently, because I've been looking at hydrogen fuel cells, of which I knew very little until recently, is uh, the Korean leader, Doosan Fuel Cell, um, which is a major player in Korea, not really known internationally. It's already had a very significant re-rating, but I think you're going to see continued interest in that company from international investors. Manyi, the same question to you. Okay, well, um, a company we like here is uh, Naver Corp. Um, I guess it has already seen a pretty steep rally in June, but we believe that it can sustain its momentum in the second half, considering there are still many interesting initiatives still to launch. Um, like, for example, the luxury e-commerce platform in collaboration with Shinsege. It's um, going to expand its um, grocery shopping service. Um, its progress and logistics is quite incredible, with um, two more centers yet to open. Um, on top of that, it's edge in search and payment. We just think there is a lot of catalyst still for this stock to continue to rally. And finally, James. I would like to ask you the same question as well. So I think we've heard a lot of good recommendations. We've heard about a lot of dynamic sectors. Let me leave you with two thoughts. The first one is I care very much about the Korean economy. And as we all know, Korea is a country with no natural resources of its own. But as we shift from gasoline and diesel vehicles, as the world tries to shift away from coal as the provider of electricity, Korea is unique in having an enormous economic opportunity if we, if we solve that equation successfully. My final note, uh, my final thought for all of us is that COVID has shown us that the domestic economy in any country can be run on a completely different basis. And I'm talking about uh, working from home, uh, where resources no longer have to come to offices and stuff like that. And there are a lot of sectors starting to be affected by this, some of them negatively, but I think the positive ones are very, very interesting. And we all know that Coupang uh, is one of those home delivery services that was listed recently on the US stock market. There are a number of players like that that are going to benefit from what I'll call this part of the new economy, the post-COVID economy, where we have a lot of stuff delivered to us at home instead of going out and having to get it in a restaurant or in a supermarket or in a department store. This whole home delivery economy and the players that are going to monetize that, uh, I think, is an area to pay a lot of attention to. Thank you, Bruce. Manyi Kwan, Senior Partner at Fargo Wealth Group Limited in Hong Kong. Simon Hopkins, CEO of Miltrust International in Singapore, and James Rooney, Chairman at Advanced Capital Partners in Seoul, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your unique insights on the markets. I want to thank the viewers for joining us today. It's a hot summer and COVID-19 is still with us. So until next time we meet, please be safe and healthy.